What do you remember most about recording that self-titled album? Like when you reflect from time to time, is there something that a memory or a story or something that stands out? Yeah. Um, well, for one thing, just overall, it was completely enjoyable. And, and you have to realize this is our first big opportunity. So every moment was like the most exciting moment of my life. Okay. Besides that, the unique situation of working with a, a really great engineer that didn't know English well, but was the funniest man on earth. And one of the most creative, and I told you about the tire iron turning into the ACDC church bell. When we needed an explosion, he did not use a sound effects record. And we had a pinball machine there that had an explosion on it. So he put a mic on that. We used that for the explosion. Just things like that. The, the way he, his sense of humor was even not knowing the language, it made it even more funny, the things he would do, like answering the phone. He would say, telephone, <laughs> you know, and that's about all he knew. So it was just, it was overall enjoying, uh, very enjoyable in that sense. And um, just having the opportunity, you know, because it was what we were fighting for for about five years. You know, we just wanted an opportunity and, and we were actually living a dream in a way because it, it was, you know, we used to pretend, we used to do interviews with each other, just pretending like it was a journalist. You know, how long the ba has the band been together? You know, <laughs> and we would add to it, like, like we were practicing interviews. It was hysterical. It's like a kid with a dream. So we pretended like we were there already. When we played in the living room, we used to say, Forum, good night, like we were playing the Los Angeles Forum. Just stuff like that. So to be have it become a reality and be in the studio with a, you know, a huge producer like Michael Wagner, it was like, we're seeing the dream unfold a little bit. This is like real now. So I remember that being really present from day to day. You guys are big locally. You're also kind of on... Uh... I can't remember the exact sequence, but I know I know Motley Crue had put their record out. But really, you're kind of one of those first. I mean, aside from, of course, Quiet Right before that, but um, then yeah. you have Motley Crue, and then I don't had Black and Blue released that self-titled album yet. I don't. I don't believe so. Um, I don't think Wasp but, uh, had come out yet. I, I think you were kind of like one of those first bands, weren't you, from it, LA? It was the first. I. I'm almost positive we were the first to be played on the radio with no record deal. But Motley Crue had been signed a year before and had already moved to Electra. So they were they were kind of on their way when we met Niven. You know, and the other thing on paper, we didn't figure to be the band that's going to be discovered from L.A., at least not in our minds. In our minds, there was much bigger bands locally, and that's the way that my thinking was, at least. that They're definitely more popular because they were playing weekends at the Starwood, and we were playing like on Monday nights and Sunday nights, and it just took... Uh, oh, so even as you're recording the self-titled album, you guys aren't just huge locally? Oh, no, no. Then, then we were... We were really known. I'm talking about as up and comers before being discovered. We were not in like the top five group, the band's most likely to make it. It just took somebody being in the crowd that could recognize that we had some potential. And that's all we wanted. That's why we played so often. We just wanted somebody to be in the crowd one night that could help us get to the next level, whatever that would be. We played so many gigs for free, it would blow your mind. And that's Part of what the Van Halen influence on me was their work ethic. Anyways, I went to Jack before and I go, dude, we have to play more than every band in L.A. if we're going to have a chance. At least give ourselves a chance to get lucky, a better chance. If we just play on Saturday twice a month, what are the chances somebody's going to see us? We need to play like 20 gigs a month. Play free. We didn't care. You talked about them last time. Are there any moments with Van Halen or any shows or meeting them or anything like back in the day before they really broke? Uh, 
in the very early days, me and the, my bass player, we sat on the stage at a place called Walter Mitty's and talked to the singer because we wanted to know how they got their gigs because they were they were playing like it seemed like every night. And Roth and his gravelly voice said that him and Ed just get on the horn and you know call this place and call that place. So it wasn't like they had an agent. They just got on the phone and worked everything themselves. But they played so often. That's what I mean about that being a big part of my influence. Besides, the guitar player was just a killer. You know, there's nothing I could do about that. He's just great. But I wanted to know more about why do they play so much? How? How? I wanted to know if they had an agent. And Rod told us, like I said, he said, him and Ed just get on the horn and they call and they get the gig that way. So I go, however we got to do it, we got to play more. And we really did play a lot. We were playing during the week. We were playing in the weekends. This one club practically adopted us called the Woodstock in Anaheim. So we played there a lot. We played the Troubadour, the Starwood, Whiskey, In Your Backyard. You know, <laughs> so if we weren't playing a club, we were in somebody's backyard. It was uh, this pretty healthy music scene, a lot of competition, a lot of great guitar players, great singers, just a lot of bands and a lot of places to play. 